A dark and winged silhouette of a muscular man soars effortlessly across the backdrop of a charcoal gray sky. Nobody knows his true identity. He's hunted ruthlessly by the community. The police want him gone. Locals are divided about whether he's a force for good or for evil. Some believe him to be a hero, a silent guardian and watchful protector of the community. Others believe him to be a menace causing destruction and pandemonium wherever he appears. Whenever trouble or disaster strikes in the area, he can sometimes be spotted. If you think I'm talking about Batman, you're a dumbass. Welcome back to episode 11 of Super Mystery Bros, the podcast where we talk about the world's most shocking and horrifying mysteries. My name is Nate, and with me again as my co-host is Kyle, and we thank you for tuning in to what's been called the global guts of podcasts. Kyle, how are you, man? It's good I'm to see you. I'm doing good, Nate. It's good to see you, too. So I understand that you've got a birthday this weekend, man. How old are you going to be? I'm going to be 35. Oof. God damn, man, that sucks. Yep, I feel it. I feel it, man. Old age getting to me. Well, you know, here, remember... here's, to, here's to Freedom 35, man. <laughs> freedom 35. Cheers. Well, bummer news aside, I've got something really important that I need to ask you. All right, hit me with it. What can people do to support us on our treacherous ascent to the summit of the aggro crag known as mystery? Well... As always, listeners can leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, it'd be great if you could hit the five-star button on Spotify. And if you don't have either of those apps, just leave a rating and or review on whatever app you have. It really helps us out. Yeah, so if you guys haven't listened to the 10-episode retrospective yet, I put out an offer for the next three people who leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. So that includes you, George. If you're listening, you haven't got back to us, you can email us or leave us a voice message on our website, and we're going to let you pick an upcoming mystery for us to cover. So thank you to George and also to Maya Tech, uh, for doing us a solid there. And thanks in advance to the next three people who do this. You can shoot us an email at supermysterybrospodcast at gmail.com and let us know that it was from you. And you can let us know what mystery that you'd like us to cover in the near future. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about the Mothman, which was the topic that our longtime listener Maya Tej requested from us. Um, this case is somewhat local to her. So early shout out to Maya Tej for picking this riveting mystery. Kyle, are you ready to spill your guts? I am ready to spill, but not my beer. Point Pleasant, West Virginia. The name itself sounds fake and made up, like the perfect picturesque anywhere USA setting for a small town, 1950s era, wholesome family television show, akin to the Andy Griffith show or Leave it to Beaver. Home to the grandparents of Mark Twain and the birthplace of WWE wrestler Ray the Crippler Stevens. It lies in Mason County, West Virginia, in the far west of the state. Point Pleasant is a border town separated from Ohio by the mighty Ohio River itself, nestled at the junction of the Ohio River and the Kanawha River. In the 1960s, it was a place where you could leave your doors unlocked and where latchkey kids could go out and ride their bikes off of sweet jumps without helmets on, burn ants with magnifying glasses, or go off into the woods to shoot at each other with BB guns, or just light some shit on fire. 
Fucking tire swings, tree forts, kids wearing propeller hats. You get the idea. Sword fighting with sticks. Do, do you remember riding bikes and skateboards with no helmets and burning ants with magnifying glasses? Because I do. Nah, dude, I, I wasn't cool like that. I had to fucking wear a helmet everywhere. Oh, bummer. It was a place where crime was practically unheard of, and helpful local policemen offered life advice and wisdom to young, bright-eyed whippersnappers. A place, if you will, where the word stranger was not in the local lexicon. However, by 1966, Point Pleasant would be the setting not for a utopian 1950s-style wholesome family television show, but for a real-life horror flick in which its residents could not simply walk out of the theater from, cover their eyes during the scary parts, or stop the tape and return it to their local blockbuster video. Their eyes would be collectively pried open as they were forced to bear witness to a wave of terror that would come washing over their tranquil and God-fearing community, a wave of terror so sinister that only the dead would be protected from it, and the trauma it caused would echo into eternity. Spooky. November 12, 1966, The Prologue. We begin our story just east of Point Pleasant in Clendenin, West Virginia, where two grave diggers were hard at work shoveling dirt in the local Kunt Cemetery as they were preparing to welcome a new permanent resident who was moving in. As they glanced up from their work and wiped the sweat from their brows, they noticed an ominous, sinister creature moving from tree to tree, which they would later describe as a, quote, brown human being, end quote. This would be a sinister omen for the events to come. This is what we in the biz call foreshadowing. Two days later, November 14th, 1966. At the home of Newell Partridge near Salem, West Virginia, about 90 miles northeast of Point Pleasant as the crow flies, the story would take an even more dire turn. At about 10.30 p.m. that night, his television set began to malfunction, which caused it to give off a loud whining noise, which would wind up to a high pitch before coming back down and repeating. Just outside of the home, on the porch, his dog Bandit, who was a large German shepherd, began to wail. Mr. Partridge grabbed a flashlight and went outside to investigate. Quote, The dog was sitting on the end of the porch, howling down toward the hay barn in the bottom. I shined the light in that direction, and it picked up two red circles, or eyes, which looked like bicycle reflectors. Still, there was something about those eyes that's difficult to explain. When I was a kid, I night hunted all the time, and I certainly know what animal eyes look like, such as coon, dog, and cat eyes in the dark. These were much larger for one thing. It's a good length of a football field to that hay barn, probably about 150 yards. Still, those eyes showed up huge for that distance." End quote. When Mr. Partridge's flashlight beam hit the so-called eyes, his dog bandit immediately snarled and ran toward them. Mr. Patridge felt an overwhelming sense of fear and decided not to pursue the dog and instead opted to head back inside and slept with a loaded gun next to his bed. Now, I just want to say I have three dogs and even in the fear of death, I wouldn't leave my dog out there. It's some monster. <laughs> I'd go after my dog. But then again, my dogs aren't German shepherds. So what do I know? He, prob he probably <laughs> figured that the German shepherd could hold its own. Yeah. The next morning... He went out looking for the dog. Quote, I walked out to the barn looking for tracks. Here and there I could see Bandit's paw prints. These were rather easy to find for he was a heavy dog and the area was muddy. End quote. At the approximate location of the eyes, he found a large number of paw prints, which were going around in circles. According to Partridge, this was unusual. Quote, Those tracks were going in a circle, as if the dog had been chasing his tail, though he never did that. And that was that. I couldn't see them go off anywhere, though I did see a series of fresh tracks which apparently led from the porch to the spot where he ran in circles. There were no other tracks of any kind, end quote. To Partridge, Bandit seemingly vanished into thin air after confronting whatever it was that was attached to those glowing red eyes. Quote, I think that the hardest thing to explain is the feeling involved. 
except to say that it was an eerie feeling. I have never had this sort of feeling before. It was as if you knew something was wrong, but couldn't place just what it was, end quote. We take you now to what's known as the TNT area, just outside of Point Pleasant, West Virginia. This area, prior to 1966, was where high explosives were manufactured during World War II, seven miles outside of town, which at the time, Stat abandoned deep inside of the McClintic Wildlife Station, an animal reserve and bird sanctuary. Miles of underground tunnels had been dug, which linked factories and other buildings together. Despite the, ev the heavy ordnance that was produced there, it looked like nothing more than what it was supposed to be, a haven for birds and other animals in the Ohio River Valley. As World War II came to an end, the whole factory complex was abandoned. The explosives were removed and the entrances of the tunnels were blocked with thick concrete slabs. By the 1960s, what once stood as an impressive camouflaged factory complex now stood in near complete ruin as the entire area was now an overgrown post-apocalyptic playground where teenagers and young adults would hang out and occasionally get freaky with each other. The dirt roads surrounding the complex were used as drag strips for the local youths to put their own West Virginia spin on Tokyo drifting. Hunting clubs had built an archery range in a picnic area, and despite the eerie visuals, was not a place that was considered to have paranormal activity of any kind. A large generator plant still stood near the entrance to the complex as a solemn reminder of the passage of time. Its boilers rusted and its windows busted out as the occasional gusts of wind blew through and rattled the steel catwalks high above. November 15th at 11.30 p.m., the very next day after Newell Partridge lost his dog Bandit. Roger and Linda, Roger and Linda Scarberry, a young married couple, and Stephen and Mary Mallett, another young married couple, were out driving along State Route 62 in the Scarberry's 1957 Chevy, just north of Point Pleasant. Roger was behind the wheel with the rest of the gang as passengers. The group was bored and just looking for a good time, but nobody else seemed to be out and about that night with all the back roads deserted. As they circled their way around the complex, searching for anybody else to hang out with, they made their way toward the unlocked gate in front of the generator plant. As Roger pulled up alongside the plant, they noticed something odd. As they gazed into the darkness, the gang saw two large glowing red circles, about two inches in diameter and six inches apart. Roger slammed on the brakes. What is it? Mary yelled from the back seat. As they watched the glowing red lights bob up and down, slowly moving away from the building, the four teenagers were shocked and horrified by what they saw. The lights were not lights at all. They were the large, glowing red eyeballs of some type of huge, horrific-looking winged creature. It was grayish in color and had thick and muscular man-like legs, apparently never having skipped leg day in its life. The group sat staring at the creature for a few moments, stunned and awestruck, before Steve exclaimed, Let's get out of here! Then... Like a bat out of hell, Roger put the pedal to the metal and floored it out of there, hauling ass out of the gate and headed straight for Route 62. Then, they saw it again, this time standing on top of a small hill before it spread its bat-like wings and took off straight up into the air. Roger made the turn onto Route 62 on two wheels in a maneuver that would make Vin Diesel blush. As Roger frantically pressed the gas pedal down in an effort to put as much distance between the car and the creature, they saw it again. My God, it's following us, the Mullets cried from the back seat. By this time, Roger was doing 100 miles per hour down the highway, and yet the hideous winged creature was keeping up with the car effortlessly, without even flapping its wings. According to the youths, the creature let out a loud, horrific sound, similar in sound to the squeak of a large mouse, and followed them all the way to the city limits before stopping its pursuit. Roger later stated the following, quote, 
funny thing. We noticed a dead dog by the side of the road there. A big dog. But when we came back a few minutes later, the dog was gone. End quote. The teenagers drove directly to the Mason County Courthouse and ran straight into the sheriff's office, still visibly shaken and afraid, and told the entire story to Deputy Halstead, who was on duty at the time. Deputy Halstead later said, quote, I've known these kids all their lives. They'd never been in any trouble, and they were really scared that night. I took them seriously, end quote. Deputy Halstead agreed to follow them back to the TNT area where they had first spotted the creature. Once they had arrived back at the TNT area, they could find no sign of the creature. However, as Deputy Halstead turned on his police radio, a loud signal blasted through it, drowning out the voice of the police dispatcher in Point Pleasant, which sounded like a tape recorder being played back at very high speed. Although Deputy Halstead was very shaken by this, he didn't want to look like a total bitch in front of the teenagers, so he remained silent. He peered into the old building, but wasn't brave enough to do a thorough search. His search turned up nothing unusual. So would you rather take your chances searching for the Mothman by yourself, or would you rather look like a bitch in front of these teenagers? No, man, I think he played it right. You know, like not show that you're scared, but just kind of like poke your head around like a little bit with yeah, a he gun took the drawn. Middle, <laughs> the middle position. Yeah. Act, act, act like you're searching. Yeah. <laughs> The incident attracted the attention of local reporters who wrote up the following article in the November 16th edition of the Point Pleasant Register. Quote, it was a bird or something. It definitely wasn't a flying saucer. End quote. Two Point Pleasant couples said today they encountered a man-sized bird-like creature in the TNT area about midnight last night. Sheriff's deputies and city police went to the scene about 2 o'clock this morning, but were unable to spot anything. But the two young men telling their story this morning were dead serious and asserted they hadn't been drinking. Steve Millett of 3305 Jackson Avenue and Roger Scarberry of 809 30th Street described the thing as being about 6 or 7 feet tall, having a wingspan of 10 feet and red eyes about 2 inches in diameter and 6 inches apart. Quote, it was like a man with wings, Millette said. It wasn't like anything you'd see on TV or in a monster movie, end quote. The men and their wives were in Scarberry's car between 11.30 p.m. and midnight when they spotted the creature near the old power plant adjacent to the old National Guard Armory buildings. The creature was seen standing on three occasions and was described as being extremely fast. Quote, it flew about 100 miles per hour, end quote, in flight, but was a clumsy runner. Deputy Millard Halstead said he had seen dust in the vicinity of a coal field, but, quote, it could have been, end quote, caused by the bird, he said. Quote, I'm a hard guy to scare, Scarberry said, but last night I was for getting out of there, end quote. They did just that, but the thing followed them. They said it was hovering the car, apparently gliding, until they reached the National Guard Armory on Route 62. Quote, We went downtown, turned around, and went back, and there it was again, Millett said. It seemed to be waiting on us. End quote. He said the light gray creature then scurried through a field. It also had flown across the top of the car. Quote, It apparently is afraid of light, Millett reasoned, and maybe it thought it was scaring us off. End quote. The young men said they saw the creature's eyes, which glowed red, only when their lights shined on it, and it seemed to want to get away from the lights. They said it looked like a quote-unquote man with wings, but that the head was quote, not an outstanding characteristic, end quote. Both were slightly pale and tired from lack of sleep during the night following their harrowing experience. They speculated that the thing was living in the vacant power plant possibly in one of the huge boilers. Quote, there are pigeons in all the other buildings, Millette said, but not in that one, end, end quote. Quote, if I had seen it while by myself, I wouldn't have said anything, Scarberry commented, but there were four of us who saw it, end quote. 
They said it didn't resemble a bat in any way, but, quote, maybe what you would visualize as an angel, end quote. The last time they saw it was at the gate of the C.C. Lewis farm on Route 62. They heard a sound like wings flapping, and they said the bird rose straight up in the air like a helicopter. Quote, this doesn't have an explanation to it, Millette said. It was an animal, but nothing like I've seen before, end quote. Are they going back to look for the creature? Quote, yes, Millette said. This afternoon and again tonight, end quote. Quote, today, Scarberry said. But tonight, I don't know. End of article. The next morning, on November 16th, 1966, Sheriff George Johnson called a press conference to talk about the events of the previous night. Local reporters interviewed the four teenagers, and the story was sent out on the AP wire. That evening, the bird was the talk of the entire Ohio Valley area. A copy editor gave it the moniker Mothman, taking inspiration from the Batman character. That very same day, lines of cars slowly circled around the old power plant, with passengers armed to the teeth. Local men carrying guns descended upon the area, poking their rifle barrels into every nook and cranny of the vicinity, ready to pump hot lead into the freakish creature now known as the Mothman. The armed and liquored up mob was unsuccessful in finding the creature, but one carload of people that night spotted a strange red light that was flying around in the sky. Mr. and Mrs. Raymond Wam Wamsley and Mrs. Marcella Bennett, along with her baby daughter Tina, watched as it soared amongst the backdrop of a darkened sky, baffled as to what it might be. Quote, it wasn't an airplane. We couldn't figure out what it was, end quote, Mrs. Bennett said. The group were some of the only people there that night who were not actively looking for the creature, and were there only to visit the Thomases, who lived in a bungalow in the area. However, the Thomases were not home, except for their three children, and so they turned around and headed back to their car. Gunshots could be heard in the distance from a trigger-happy local who was probably several beers deep near the plant. As they approached their car, a sinister figure began to stir behind it. According to Mrs. Bennett, it seemed as if it had been disturbed by the group while it was lying down, and it slowly rose up to its feet. It was large and gray, bigger than a man, and had horrific-looking glowing red eyes. Mrs. Bennett was so shocked by what she was seeing that she dropped her baby on the ground, who was thankfully not seriously injured. Wow. Drop in your baby. Nice. She stood staring at the creature, unable to move, almost hypnotized by its glowing red eyes. As its large wings slowly unfolded from its back, Raymond, Raymond Wamsley grabbed her and her child and they ran back to the Thomas's bungalow as fast as they could, bursting through the door, slamming it shut, and then bolting it. They heard it stepping around on the porch and saw its red eyes glaring in through the window. The women and children were hysterical and inconsolable as Raymond frantically phoned the police. Ironically, Less than a mile away were hundreds of people who were armed to the teeth, but had no way of knowing of the horrific encounter which was happening just a stone's throw away. By the time the police arrived, the creature was already gone, and the large mob of armed men would only later hear of this encounter in the newspaper the following day. The following morning, November 17th at 4.45 a.m., just across the Ohio River from the TNT area, Mrs. Roy Gross, who was a music teacher, was wakened by the barking of her dog. Alarmed, she got up to investigate it. According to her, the moon was out and very bright, and as she looked out of her kitchen window, she was stunned by what she saw. An enormous circular object about the size of a small house was hovering at treetop level in a field on the other side of Route 7. It was divided into sections with brilliant bright red and green lights. She was stunned, but before she could wake up her husband, the object made a zigzag type motion before suddenly disappearing. Strange things were beginning to be afoot in the Ohio River Valley. That same afternoon, a 17-year-old boy was driving down Route 7 
near to Mrs. Gross's home when he reported a quote-unquote huge bird suddenly diving at his car, which pursued him for about half a mile. The following day, on November 18th, two Point Pleasant firemen were in the TNT area when they reportedly encountered a giant bird with big red eyes. They stated, quote, It was definitely a bird, but it was huge. We'd never seen anything like it, end quote. By this time, sightings of the strange bird, or quote-unquote Mothman, were starting to be reported in Mason, Lincoln, Logan, Kanawha, and Nicholas counties, and good old boys from all over the area were flocking to the TNT area, armed with shotguns, rifles, and cans of Budweiser, hoping to either catch a glimpse of the creature or the opportunity to mount its unearthly head on their trophy wall. Despite the enthusiasm for the creature, the few who had actually caught a glimpse of it hoped to never see it again. November 20th, five teenagers were driving along Campbell's Creek that night and were shocked as the headlights from the car illuminated a man-sized, bird-like creature which was standing near a rock quarry, which then turned around and ran into the nearby woods. That same night, an elderly businessman in Point Pleasant exited his front door as he investigated what his dog was barking at. He was horrified to see the Mothman standing in his front yard. He described it as a six to seven foot tall gray apparition with glowing eyes. He stood there, staring at it for several minutes, unable to move, before the creature suddenly flew off. His wife later said that he was so pale and shaken up that she thought he was having a heart attack. November 24th, 1966. Two adults and two children were driving past the TNT area when they looked up and spotted a giant flying creature with red glowing eyes. So many people were now seeing this creature that reports like these were beginning to turn the media intrigue into a total media frenzy. Thousands of people were showing up from hundreds of miles away, and even television crews from other states were making the trek to the TNT area, hoping to catch a glimpse of the beast. However, the Mothman was not one to be outsmarted, and began to instead show up in unexpected places, in front of witnesses who had previously been skeptical of its, ex of its existence. The reports kept on coming. November 25th, as a young shoe salesman named Thomas Urey drove along Route 62 just north of the TNT area, he spotted a tall, gray, man-like figure standing in a field by the road. According to Urey, it suddenly spread its wings and took off straight up into the air like a helicopter. Quote, it veered over my convertible and began going in circles three telephone poles high, end quote, he later stated. As Yuri floored the gas pedal, the creature swooped down right over his vehicle. Despite doing 75 miles per hour, the creature was able to keep flying right over his car. The creature stopped its pursuit as he reached the city limits of Point Pleasant, and much like the Scarberries and the Molettes, drove straight to the sheriff's office in a panicked state. Quote, I never saw anything like it. I was so scared I just couldn't go to work that day. This thing had a wingspan every bit of 10 feet. It could be a bird, but I certainly never saw one like it. I was afraid it was going to come down right on top of me. End quote. All in all, more than 100 adults between 1966 and 1967 reported seeing this creature. Surprisingly, they all agreed on the same basic description of it. It was gray in color, had no feathers, larger than a man, had a wingspan of about 10 feet, had the ability to take off straight up into the air, and did not flap its wings while flying. No one could describe its face with much detail, as its red glowing eyes were hypnotic and distracting, causing most, if not all, of the witnesses' focus to be drawn to them instead. November 26. Ruth Foster, a housewife in St. Albans, a suburb of Charleston, West Virginia, received the shock of her life when she found the Mothman standing on her front lawn. Quote, It was standing on the lawn beside the porch. It was tall, with big red eyes that popped out of its face. My husband is maybe six feet one, and this bird looked about the same height, or a little shorter maybe. It had a funny little face, 
I didn't see any beak. All I saw were those big, red, poppy eyes. I screamed and ran back into the house. My brother-in-law went out to look, but it was gone. End quote. The horrific encounters just kept coming. November 27th. The Mothman chased a young 18-year-old lady by the name of Connie Carpenter near the Mason, West Virginia golf course. As she drove home from church that day, she spotted what she described as a huge gray figure which was shaped like a man but much larger, at least 7 feet tall and very broad. To Connie, though, the most peculiar thing was not its size or color, but its large, round, and fiercely glowing red eyes. She slowed her car down, and as she did so, the creature's wings unfolded from its back. Connie insisted that it was definitely not a bird, but it was man-shaped and rose off of the ground straight up without even flapping its wings. It began to give chase to her car, swooping in low over her head as she put the pedal to the metal in a frantic effort to outrun the creature. The ordeal didn't end there, as she began to hear loud beeping type noises outside of her bedroom window on several occasions, and someone even attempted to abduct her in February of the following year. Over the next week, no sightings of the Mothman were reported. The residents of the Ohio River Valley cautiously breathed a sigh of relief, hoping that they had seen the last of the Mothman. They hadn't. December 4th, 1966. A group of five men who were standing in a field near the Galapolis, Ohio airport, which was just across the river from Point Pleasant, West Virginia, spotted a large, winged silhouette soaring effortlessly along the Ohio River, about 300 feet in the air and traveling at about 70 miles per hour. As it got closer, they realized that this was no plane, but some sort of bird with an extremely long neck, and despite how fast it was traveling, its wings were not flapping. My God, it's something prehistoric, one of the men cried. One of the men grabbed his camera and sprinted as fast as he could toward his plane, but by the time he was able to get airborne, it had already vanished somewhere down the river. Deputy Halstead, who you may remember from earlier in the story as the police officer who helped the two teenage couples in the initial encounter, stated, quote, There is something to it. The people who have seen this bird were all mighty scared. They saw something. I don't know what. Some say it was a crane, end quote. When asked if there had been any sightings of flying saucers in the area, he replied, quote, No, I, we haven't heard any of that. Just the bird. That's enough. End quote. Reports of the Mothman simmered down over the next year, but the entire story came to a head on December 15, 1967, the following year, when disaster struck. At approximately 5 p.m. that day, the U.S. Highway 35 Bridge, also known as the Silver Bridge, which connected Point Pleasant and Canuga, Ohio, collapsed suddenly. Out of 37 total vehicles on the bridge at the time, 31 of those plunged into the Ohio River, killing 46 people and seriously injuring 9. Locals reported spotting the Mothman flying over the bridge shortly before the collapse leading many to believe that the Mothman was either responsible for the bridge collapse or conversely, trying to warn or signal people of the impending disaster. An investigation into the disaster, however, found that the cause of the collapse was a fracture in one of the bridge's suspension chains. The fracture was the result of stress corrosion and corrosion fatigue that had developed over the bridge's 40-year lifespan. The catastrophe sparked national concern over bridge safety across the U.S., and then-President Lyndon B. Johnson ordered all U.S. bridges to undergo safety inspections. In December of 1970, legislation was enacted that established national requirements for bridge inspection and evaluation. However, this did not stop all bridge collapses in the country, as several other bridge collapse disasters have happened since, causing deaths and injuries. In a 2017 article by Don Carroll, a senior highway accident investigator and national resource specialist in the NTSB Office of Highway Safety, he writes, quote, On December 15th, 
as we mark the 50th anniversary of the Silver Bridge collapse, let's focus on the infrastructure improvements we still need to make five decades later, rather than try to place the blame on mythical creatures like the Mothman. Throughout the NTSB's history, we have investigated catastrophic bridge collapses with one goal in mind, preventing further tragedies. Despite efforts to continually enhance the quality of our bridge inspections, unforeseen disasters continue to occur, highlighting the need to thoroughly inspect and replace bridges before they collapse. Supernatural forces do not bring down bridges. Neglect does. End quote. Much like his cousin the Batman, people are divided about whether Mothman is a benevolent protector or a malevolent menace. As far as the National Transportation Safety Board was concerned, however, the Mothman had nothing to do with the disaster. However, many locals are convinced of the Mothman's involvement, either as the cause of the disaster itself, a bad omen that preceded it, or as a protector who was trying to warn the people of the imminent collapse. More recently, in 2016, a local Point Pleasant man who claimed to have recently moved to Point Pleasant and did not even know about the Mothman legend snapped a photograph of a dark silhouette of what appeared to be a humanoid form with wings flying in the air against a darkened sky as he drove down State Route 2. So, man, I want to ask you, what do you make of this picture that we're looking at here? How aside, would you describe it to our audience? Aside from it strikes me as rather creepy... Um, it's pretty grainy, you know, just like what you would expect for, uh, old photos of cryptids. You know, everyone knows the pictures of the Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot. Very grainy. But this, you know, I don't really want to say it, but I'm going to say it. Looks like a bat. You know, looks like a bat man with weird legs. <laughs> There's something weird it going on with the legs, but it, it, it does not look like a moth. It looks like a bat with maybe a human lower torso and legs and a big head. You know, I was looking at this picture myself and I was trying to figure out if maybe we're looking at this in the wrong way. Like maybe is it, if it's some sort of crane that, you know, that that's the neck on the right, but I, uh, I don't know what to make. Eh. I don't, I don't know what to make of the, the lower part though. It, it, it would look like it has two, two heads or something. Um, Unless Instead the lower legs. part is a reflection and the thing is not actually flying at all and it's, I don't know, on the ground. Although why its there's, wings there's, would be open on the ground is beyond me. There's no way to verify what this thing could be. It, for all we know, it could be a, some sort of figurine dangling from some fishing <laughs> wire or something. Yeah. Because there's, there's, no, there's no backdrop. There's no backdrop yeah. except for... Gray. What's alleged to be a, a darkened sky in the back. Yeah. Yeah. It's a grainy gray backdrop with a fuzzy black figure. But but now you said that I can see it backwards, kind of, like a bird. You know, the, the wings make more sense, almost like it has like tail feathers, like that would be the nub mm -hmm. that is the head. The neck definitely looks a little weird, but that might explain why these quote unquote legs and lower torso look so strange yeah I, I don't know what to make of this today the legend of the mothman lives on in point pleasant west virginia with statues erected of the creature mothman themed everything and even its own museum and with that we leave you with a quote from jeff wamsley a native of point pleasant and founder of the mothman museum quote i think the mothman story is timeless it's never been fully solved or proven as to what these people were seeing. People come here to see for themselves and to investigate on their own, to make up their own minds. Everyone has their own theory. It's a part of the town's history, end quote. If you can't get enough of the Mothman, why don't you take a trip down to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, and stay a while, won't you? All right, man, um, let's go over some of the popular theories. So this would be the Sandhill Crane Theory. As you can see, we've got two pictures of a sandhill crane. What do you think? Just your first glance at, at these creatures. Do you think that anyone could mistake this for a six to seven foot tall man-like creature with glowing red eyes? No fucking way, man. Two, two inch eyes, six inches apart, and that tiny bird head. Plus, like, that, it, it doesn't say, but the 
that crane can't be more than like a couple feet tall. I mean, like I've seen some pretty big cranes. I give well, it like three feet. You well, know? I think that's I think that's just the 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 picture of fooling you because these things are actually, if I recall, five five something feet tall. Not Jeez. six or seven feet tall, but these are these are the second tallest cranes in the U.S. Wow, I did not guess that at five feet tall. Mm-hmm. But but still, the eyes, bird eyes, are very close together. You know, I mean, e- even if they glowed red in the dark, the the distance between them should be about the the diameter of the eyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I don't think that the glowing red eyes can be explained by this. Although I do think that maybe some of the sightings were um, sandhill cranes. I don't think that they were all caused by by sandhill cranes. Some people believe the entire Mothman hysteria was caused solely by the misidentification of the sandhill crane, which is the second largest crane in the U.S., and that it simply wandered out of its typical migration route. In an article from the Gettysburg Times dated December 1st, 1966, They wrote the following, Monster bird with red eyes may be crane. Point Pleasant, West Virginia, Associated Press. The mysterious Mothman was still at large near this normally quiet Ohio River community, but the excitement he caused is dying down. The excitement began two weeks ago when Mr. and Mrs. Roger Scarberry and Mr. and Mrs. Steve Millette, all of Point Pleasant, spotted a large white apparition flying at high speed following their car. They told the deputy sheriff it looked like a, quote, flying man with 10-foot wings, end quote. They said it was about seven feet tall with large red eyes. These reports brought curious crowds to the McClintic Wildlife Station where the incident occurred. Volunteer fire department members had to help keep traffic moving. Suspect, Sandhill Crane. During the next three days, at least eight persons reported various similar creatures. On November 18th, two volunteer firemen, Captain Paul Yoder and Benjamin Enox, said they saw what definitely was a very large bird with large red eyes. Dr. Robert L. Smith, Associate Professor of Wildlife Biology at West Virginia University, said the descriptions all fitted the Sandhill Crane, the second largest American crane, which stands almost as high as a man and has a wingspan of more than seven feet. He said the red eyes could be the large circles of bare reddish flesh around the crane's eyes. Smith said the bird apparently had wandered out of its normal migration route. So I just want to say here, I don't know how anyone in their right mind could mistake the tiny red top of the crane's head as a, as two glowing red eyes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, that would kind of explain the size, but once again, the gap between them, very narrow, and, you know, even though it's vibrant red, those aren't going to glow at night, you know, the the little red feathers they have around their eyes. Yeah, I agree. The Mothman. Could he be an alien? Some people point out that there was a flap of UFO sightings in the area which overlapped the Mothman sightings, such as the one from Miss Gross, who spotted an enormous circular craft hovering over a field near Route 7. Others point out to the fact that the Mothman creature is able to fly without actually flapping its wings, with no visible sign of propulsion. Rather than flying like a bird, he was described as flying more like Buzz Lightyear. Furthermore, It's alleged that some Mothman witnesses, including a journalist who was reporting on the Mothman story, Mary Heyer, were visited by the mysterious so-called Men in Black, who instructed them to stop talking about what they saw. So what do you think, man? Do you think that Mothman could be an alien? Um, And do you trust these reports of the Men in Black coming around? mm, I don't know, you know, because... That there's plenty of unsolved mysteries where people talk about the men in black. Um, I I could see it maybe being an alien, an extraterrestrial creature, maybe wearing some sort of flight suit or pack to help get around, you know, uh, some technology we don't know of that doesn't make any sound to allow them to fly. And, you know, when back then when there's very little science fiction, you don't really have any reference to 
a man with wings other than Mothman, Batman, things like that. That's fair enough. All right. The Mothman, a harbinger of doom. Although the Silver Bridge disaster is the most famous case of the Mothman being an omen to impending catastrophe, there are other reported cases of Mothman sightings prior to horrific events. Several employees in the Chernobyl nuclear power plant claimed to have seen what they described as a horrid humanoid with enormous wings, a black headless body, and glowing red eyes that rose above the horizon of Chernobyl and Pripyat in the days leading up to the disaster. It was dubbed the Blackbird of Chernobyl. Located in northern Ukraine, those who were unlucky enough to witness the creature reported experiencing terrifying nightmares. Some believe this to be a variation of the Mothman, whose appearance often precedes horrific disasters. The 1986 Chernobyl disaster was brought on by a defective reactor design, which was operated by unqualified staff. The radioactive reactor core caused at least 5% of radioactive materials to be released into the environment because of steam explosions and fires, leading to the deposition of radioactive materials all across Europe. In 2002, in an article written in Russian that I wish Ivan was here to read and make sense of, it's got a bunch of backwards capital R's and backwards capital N's and shit and other strange and wacky symbols. It was written that a month prior to the Moscow apartment bombings in 1999, which killed 109 people, the Mothman was seen by residents in neighboring houses flying around the area. Mothman was also allegedly spotted flying around the Twin Towers in the days leading up to the 9-11 terrorist attacks. A similar creature was also spotted flying around a region in southeast China prior to a dam collapse in 1926, and allegedly even in Japan in March of 2011 prior to the tsunami that devastated the Tohoku region on its east coast. Wow. I did not know that the people of Chernobyl might have seen the Mothman before the disaster. It's hard Man. to verify. It's hard to verify the story. Because uh, I, I couldn't find any anyone going on record as reporting that they saw the Mothman. It's just something that circulates on the internet. So I have no no way of verifying if it's true or not. But it what is about, interesting if that's true. Yeah. What, what about the 9-11 attacks or the tsunami? Like, were, was uh, there any... This was all shit that was kind of after the fact. And I'm not sure if... Yeah. Uh, anyone actually went on record as saying that, or if it was just an internet rumor, but it's something gotcha. that pops up quite often. Cool. Mothman, a force for good. One famous case of the Mothman being an all around good dude comes to us from Freiburg, Germany, where in 1978, a group of miners came face to face with him as they tried to enter the mine. There he stood with no head and glowing red eyes on his chest blocking the entrance to the mine. The miners had initially thought it was a man wearing a trench coat until it spread its huge black wings out from its back and emitted a horrific screeching sound, sending them all running outside, terrified. The men felt a seismic, seismic rumble and a dust plume shot from the mine as it collapsed about an hour later. Had the Mothman not prevented them from entering the mine, the men would have all surely been killed in the collapse. They dubbed the creature, quote, the Friedberg Shrieker, end quote, and claimed that it had saved their lives. The Mothman. Mass hysteria? So I've got nothing here, so let's just talk about... What do you think about the, the mass hysteria hypothesis? Do you think that, for example, let's say that initial report of the four teenagers, they're all, they're all hanging out, and they all think that they saw this winged horrific creature and then it sort of takes off virally in a way and then people start believing that they saw it or they're encouraged to have seen it in order to look cool in front of other people do you know what i mean well that that would make a lot more sense nowadays you know with social media and things like that and your own social presence and media presence just being a, a way of life but back in the mid 60s in a small town where everyone knows everyone why would you start making up some bullshit to, you know, 
really just just match these teenager stories. You know, it's it's the 60s. You know, the teenagers are the ones saying crazy things. Why would the adults around town, you know, think it's a good idea to just go along with it if they're not actually seeing this creature? Well, just to play devil's advocate here, I, I, I think that times change, but people don't. And even though social media is is like the juice for most people now, um, I think back then it, it's still that same primal urge to have some sort of notoriety around town or in your your circle. So I'm thinking I'm thinking that this could easily explain some of the sightings. Maybe they they report seeing it. It, it could be not with the intention of trying to hoax the story or something like that it could just be well i want to back these other people up who i know and and like and add credence to their stories but what they do in turn is sort of blow the story up out of proportion when all they're trying to really do is help the people that they know maybe people that they trust 100 percent. i like that theory I'll give you that for definitely some of them. Like I, I won't say like any like in particular. It is weird that there were so many sightings in such a short period of time. So I am skeptical that they are all true. But I think some of them have got to be true. Some of them could be true, and I'll, I'll give you that. Um, I think that you know that that sighting of the pilots on the airfield and the guy was running towards his plane to to look for that quote unquote something prehistoric flying in the air. Yeah. I think that could have been a sandhill crane because they said that it it was some sort of freakish bird, huge bird flying at 70 miles per hour uh without flapping its wings. And I think that even for pilots it's really easy to misjudge size and distance and speed and all that. And if you get one of those factors wrong, you're going to misjudge the entire situation. So Yeah. Something with a long neck flying down river. To me, that sounds like it could easily be a, one of those sandhill cranes. So Definitely. I think in certain instances, I think in certain instances that the sandhill crane explanation is the explanation. Yeah. Uh, I think mass hysteria is also some of the explanation here. Yeah, it definitely, uh, definitely adds to people's uh, misjudgment, you know, because now you have the idea of the Mothman in your head. But yeah, it in that example, it, I believe it was the only report where they said it had a long neck where everyone else said it had little to no neck, you know, or the head wasn't a pre predominant feature. So, yeah, that definitely sounds more like a sandhill crane. Well, some people reported the long neck, some people didn't. So the 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 descriptions kind of varied. So I'm thinking that people weren't seeing the same thing in yeah. all the reports. Yeah, but they all had the same idea in their head, mm -hmm. the same preconception about what they could be seeing. Right. And um to me, man, it's like I this is one of those mysteries that I have I have no fucking idea how to explain it. I think to me, man, it's likely that there are several explanations combined together that make up this whole mystery. And I think that once this this legend kind of took off, the residents of Point Pleasant, they, they really had no incentive to try to debunk or explain it in any rational sense, because then economic incentives kind of yeah. came into place where... You know, Mothman themed restaurants, Mothman themed museums, Mothman it, themed everything. It puts and it your became, town on the map. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that um, it attracts a lot of tourism every year to this otherwise unremarkable town that nobody would would stop into unless there was something some something to draw you in into to visit their town. And this is a perfect excuse to get to get people to visit because otherwise without this legend there is nothing remarkable about this town. It's Agreed. just a small town right on the uh, right on the river and I'm not talking shit about the town. I'm sure it's a lovely place, but but just not somewhere you, know, you take vacation. Yeah, I mean it's it's no it's no Six Flags or anything. <laughs> yeah. 
no, I, I agree. There's definitely a multitude of things going on here, but I believe that someone, maybe even a few of those reports, they saw something, either something supernatural, something extraterrestrial, you know, something not of this world. And I kind of like, you know, the let, let's call it the theory of the Mothman appearing before major disasters like 9-11, like Chernobyl, you know, it it kind of gives me this weird theory that it might have something to do with um, like the Grim Reaper, because sometimes mm. people will see or claim to see weird things like that before large disasters, you know, so maybe maybe it's the Grim Reaper's forward looking scout, you know, like Falcor or something. He just <laughs> launches off his arm, you know, Mothman sits on top of his giant scythe and he's like, hey, I smell death. Go check it out. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, I don't know about that. I don't know if I can get behind that theory, but, um, you know, as for the sightings of this gray human like being that's six to seven feet tall, glowing red eyes, the ability to fly without flapping its wings. Uh, I just I don't think there's a chance in hell that that was a sandhill crane. Yeah, no, because for one, for one, they describe it as having two glowing red eyes that are separated about six inches apart, about two inches in diameter with a man like body. And it can fly without flapping its wings. I mean, to me, that's not a sandhill crane. There's no way in hell that could be a sandhill crane. No, you know, and there's, you know, like bir birds can glide without flapping, but I mean, to keep up with a car at a hundred miles an hour without flapping your wings, that's, that's no. something else. Yep. So to me, it's either something supernatural, um, some sort of hallucination or, or a hoax. I don't think that, I don't think that initial, I don't think that initial encounter was a, some sort of sandhill crane or an owl or something. That's, that's so stupid. Yeah. Agreed. So what about that, that 2016 photo of the Mothman? Do you have anything that you wanted to uh, say about that? Anything more? Not really, man. I said my piece. It looks just like the other cryptid photos, the other famous photos of Nessie and of Sasquatch. Just it could be, but it's impossible to say for sure because it is just a shitty, grainy photo of something. Yeah. And I, I think that it's a it's a fucking cool ass legend and it put their town on the map. You know, even if you don't believe in the legend of the Mothman, it, it's still kind of a cool story anyway. Yeah. Because it, it adds it adds flavor to our otherwise boring ass mundane lives on this shitty fucking rock tumbling through space. Agreed. Well, I for one believe the Mothman is out there somewhere or at least was back in Point Pleasant in the mid 60s. All right. So gun to your head. What do you think the Mothman is? If you had to take a guess, gun to your head, man. Extraterrestrial with uh, some sort of flying device, some sort of folding, fold out flying device. That's why they say they see wings come up from his back. That's how it can fly without flapping its wings, you know, and and like I said, without, you know, decades worth of science fiction movies and TV shows, you don't have a point of reference to make that sort of assumption. You know, you're just this little ho-dunk town, you know, and so you just see, man, wings. It's a man with wings. It's a giant bird. It's a bat. It's a moth. We're going to call him Mothman. And it takes off from there. Why Why Point Pleasant? Why the TNT area? Why, why would you think that it was there specifically? Well, it's hard to say why specifically, aside from Point Pleasant, sounds like the name of every tiny Midwest town in every sci-fi horror movie ever. Um, the TNT area, you know, large abandoned factory, um, you know, well boarded up to keep people out because they used to make, you know, explosive ordnance there. So it's the perfect hiding spot for a large cryptid. Do you think, do you think that the fact that explosives were made there had anything to do with it? Or do you think that it was just because it was an abandoned area? I think Where it was just it could, because it was an abandoned area, unless they were dealing with 
radioactive material that could cause a mutation in a not in World War II. Yeah, not in World War II. That was before the atomic bombs. Yeah, I think I think all the all that atomic work was being done in in New Mexico during that time. Yep. Yeah. So, well, you know the the sightings were, you know, in the sixties, but it's also long after the factory had closed. Yeah. It. Yeah. I don't think it's a, a mutated creature of any kind. I think it was just a a good hiding spot for whatever this was, you know, or maybe whatever this was, was like just hopped down from their spaceship, was just taking a poke around. Who knows? Maybe had been doing it for a whole week and that was just the place where they first saw him, the TNT area. But then again, I guess that doesn't explain why all the sightings were right there at the TNT area. Yeah, it seemed all the sightings seemed to spread virally. Like, I mean, I mean, from like the epicenter of that TNT area, people from all directions from the TNT area started seeing seeing this creature. So it was it was definitely concentrated in that area. Yeah. Uh, to me, man, I don't I don't think that this was anything paranormal in my view. I think that. I don't I can't explain that first initial sighting of the, of this thing. It could have been as simple as these teenagers misidentified something or they were they were paranoid for whatever reason. Maybe the people in the back seat were doing this kind of in a joking way to make the driver freak out. I really don't know, but I think from there all of the paranoia and the fear started to spread around town and then maybe the kids were like, "Oh shit, well now that the story has blown up into this giant story. We can't come out and say, Hey, we're, it's just a prank, bro. Calm down. It's all <laughs> It's, it's, it's already beyond. It's already yeah. beyond. Yeah. It's that it's coming too late clean now. about it. Too, too yep. late to stop this train wreck now. Dude, exactly. that would be, that would be fucked up. If you are shitting your pants at a hundred miles an hour <laughs> running for your life trying to save the lives of your passengers and you're relying on them to check your six and they're fucking with you like it's still there <laughs> man go faster <laughs> all the way back into town <laughs> but you have to think about when when we were 18 like that's the kind of shit that yeah. we, would, we would totally do yeah <laughs> i mean it, it, it's so stupid but it's it, i could see that i could see that happening to one of us in Any- our in our friend circle Anything for a good laugh, especially when you're in a tiny, boring town. Yep. And so that's kind of, that's where I lean on this one. I, I think that, man, the story just blew up, for, blew up overnight. And then they're like, oh shit, nobody say anything. Don't tell mom. You know, this, this really happened yeah. as far as we're concerned, this really happened. So yeah, I think I think that that's what happened. It spread virally. People started being paranoid. Maybe they saw a sandhill crane in the air. Oh no, that's that's Mothman. I saw I saw it. That's Mothman. Yeah. Through the power of suggestion. On uh, on a on a percentage basis, what percentage do you think that there was actually a Mothman and what percentage do you think was just misidentification, made up stories and everything else rolled into one? That's hard to say, man. Um, I'll I'll give it a maybe a fifteen percent chance that it was something paranormal. I'm not gonna say zero because I know paranormal shit exists. It's just in this case, I'm not sure because it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But I, I'll leave I'll leave some reasonable doubt here. Some reasonable doubt that it that it was a real a, a real thing that happened. Yeah. Well, at out of all those initial sightings that are all clumped together, I'd give it a, a solid 25% that they saw something not of this world. Oh, I was expecting you to say something higher than 25, because you were you were just talking about why you thought it was an alien. Yeah, but you know, it, everything you say makes sense, you know, with, with the hysteria and everything else. You know, and something I didn't think of, it's like, oh, now there's a bunch of media in our town and these people who we've known all of our lives and respect. We don't want them to look like fools to the rest of the country. So we'll just back them up, even if we didn't see anything, you know, but definitely a few people saw something real. 
Yeah, that's kind of where I stand, or, or at least at least believe they saw something real. Oh yeah. Maybe maybe it wasn't real in reality, but they believed it. Yes. All right, man. Do you have anything else you want to say before we go? I don't think so, man. This was a this was a fun episode. I'm glad we glad we did this. Who uh, which, which listener picked this episode again? Uh, Maya Tej. She's been listening to us for a while now. And, well, uh, yeah. Thank you, Maya Tej. All right, man. Do you have any apologies, shout outs or clarifications to make? Um, yeah. What one of my coworkers wanted to give him a shout out, but I've already done that before. So fuck that. Uh, instead, I'm yeah, going to fuck give, that guy. <laughs> fuck that guy. <laughs> What's his name? What's his uh, name? <laughs> Mike. Fuck you, Mike. <laughs> There's your shout out, Mike. <laughs> no, instead, I would like to give a shout out to our soon to be future AI overlords. That is coming up real soon. So here's the hoping that they are benevolent and just, or at the very least, kill us all very quick and painlessly. Right on, man. Well, I don't really have much in the way of shout outs, apologies, or clarifications this week, but I will give a shout out to Maya Tej for selecting this mystery because this was a pretty cool one. And also shout out to George. I'm still waiting if you want to email us and select a, a mystery uh, for us to do in the near future. You're free to do that, or you can just, you know, remain in the shadows. That's fine, too. We'll just continue on. I'd also like to apologize to Mike for the way that I dropped the F-bomb on him earlier. Um, it was uncalled for, and I just want to look you straight in the eyes right now, and I want to offer an apology. I don't know you, but I hear good things about you, and you sound like a straight shooter to me. All right, man, I think it's time to get out of here. Like sands through the hourglass, so too are the minutes of our podcast. But don't fret, dear listener. We'll be back again to breathe new life into an old mystery next time. Remember, folks, the truth is out there, somewhere in the ether, and through our powers combined, we'll solve that some bitch once and for all. This is Super Mystery Bros. think about the ai craze going on right now oh dude that shit's scary as fuck man yeah we are screaming towards our doom at mach 3 right now man <laughs> you know um you know what i find kind of funny or i i don't know if it's you can call it funny but ironic in a way where you know how we we grew up and all the teachers told us that you've got to You've got to get good grades, go to college and graduate with something, some like high degree. And then those those jobs that those people have are the first that are going to get fucking wiped out by AI. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Nowadays, people do go to college, graduate with a mountain of fucking debt and no job oh, just prospects. Yeah. Fucked over.